There's got to be more than going back and forth From doing right to doing wrong Cause we were taught that's who we are well, Come on, get in line right behind me You along with everybody Thinking there's worth in what you do Then like a hero who takes the stage When we're on the edge of our seat Saying it's too late let me introduce you to amazing grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises. Well, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Uh, it's a little bit warm in here. I don't know this, this air conditioner on this side. So you people on this side, this is the cool side. This one's been working. So if anybody during greeting wants to move sides... That's the cooler side of the sanctuary, just saying. <clears throat> well, I would like to uh, start off today with some scripture. So if you'd stand, uh, we will start with Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, 1 says, so Christ has really set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. And then over in, in uh, 5.13, it says, For you have been called to live in freedom, not freedom to sa satisfy your sinful nature, but freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if instead of showing love among yourselves, you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I advise you to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just the opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit desire, gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, and your choices are never free from this conflict. But when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, you are no longer subject to the law. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living the sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in, our, in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Uh, As we begin to sing, we are the free, we have freedom in Christ, amen? Amen. So join us as we sing, we are the free. Oh, 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 oh. There's a fire that burns inside A fire that burns inside Nothing can stop us When we're running through the night With a fire that burns inside A fire that burns inside We are the free, the freedom generation Singing of mercy Set is all in motion. Yours is the glory. There's a fire in our hearts and it burns for you. It's never gonna fade away. We are the free and yours is the glory. Oh, oh, oh. will not die no our passion will not die nothing can stop us when we're running through the night and our passion will not die no our passion will not die we are the free the freedom generation singing of mercy you are the one who set us all in motion yours is the glory there's a fire in our hearts and it burns for you it's never gonna fade away we are the free and yours is the glory oh 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 You are the one who set us all in motion. Yours is the glory. We are the free, the freedom generation. Singing of mercy. You are the one who set us all in motion. Yours is the glory. There's a fire in our hearts and it burns for you. It's never gonna fade away. There's a fire and it burns for you it's never gonna fade away we are the free and yours is the glory oh oh oh
guess the cat in the hat decided to show up today. I'm not sure. Welcome back, Dwight. Glad to have you here. A <laughs> uh, couple of quick announcements as you're finding your seat. There's no service tonight. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that a lot of us, and I'm, I'm guessing over 45 of us, were at Ellsworth yesterday. So thank you uh, for all of those that showed up to help us out there. Um, it was rather warm. Um, but we all survived, um, and it was really kind of cool that people just kept switching. You'd, you'd be in the sun for a while, and about the time you're thinking, man, I'm getting really hot, somebody would show up with a glass of water and say, hey, go sit down. <laughs> and then we'd stay out there, and it was just thank you to all of those. And then, if you notice we've been playing some videos about volunteering lately. I just want to say thank you. We've had a ton of people sign up to do different things. And a lot of it is behind the scenes. You probably don't even know that it happened. Uh, but it has been a tremendous help to us. So thank you to all of you that have volunteered to help. Um, and if you're still looking for places to help, we got places. So, uh, you know, if you're looking bored, we can fill your time. Um, next Sunday night, we are having the welcome back uh, for PJ. Uh, he's, that'll be his, his first Sunday back from uh, medical leave. I always want to say maternity leave because it's an M, and I know it's not. It's medical leave, medical leave, but this is the old timers or something. I don't know. It just comes up. But medical leave, PJ's coming back next Sunday, so we're excited to have him back. And so we're going to do a, a party that night. Um, and the plan is, just like we tried to do <laughs> something last time, we're planning to do games and stuff outside um, hopefully it'll be cool enough that we can do that. And uh, if yesterday is any indication, it won't be that hot. So, you know, you can go play games. The kids didn't slow down at all. And in fact, yesterday, I wish we had video, our own Trudy Rathman climbed the mountain. <laughs> and she told me that the snow cap was just a facade. It was not any cooler up there. <laughs> but all the way up, she just scaled it. It was kind of fun. So um, Sunday night, we will not have the mountain out, but, you know, Come on back for the hot dog feed next Sunday night. And then on July 19th, uh, we're having an all-church swim party at Bennington Pool. And you could say, well, I don't want to swim. Go, come hang, hang out at the pool. If you get really hot, somebody will push you in. It'll work. So <laughs> come hang out and fellowship together. Um, I think those were the three, right, Don? No service? All right. I got all my announcements in. All right. Are you guys ready to sing some more? Yes. Awesome. Why don't you stand and we will sing flawless. <laughs> to amazing grace no matter the bumps no matter the bruises no matter the scars still the truth is the cross has made the cross has made you flawless no matter the hurt or how deep the wound is no matter the pain Still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. Could it possibly be that we simply can't believe that this unconditional kind of love would be enough to take a filthy wretch like this, wrap him up in righteousness? But that's exactly what he did. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made, 
the cross has made you flawless. Ooh. Take a breath, smile, and say, right here, right now, I'm okay because the cross was enough. And like a hero who takes the stage when we're on the edge of our seats saying it's too late but well, let me introduce you to grace grace god's grace no matter the bumps no matter the bruises no matter the scars still the truth is the cross has made the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter what they say or what you think you the day you called his name, he made you flawless. He made you flawless. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. be seated. As we go to our prayer time, I have a short video before we begin. God, on the day we celebrate our nation's birth, we place our faith in you. You are the one who gives us freedom. You have endowed us with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And may we pursue you with the passion that you first pursued us. As we celebrate our great nation, we remember the sacrifice and turmoil that this country was born out of and that continues to shape us today. We know that you are not done here. We know that we are far from perfect. And we know that you have a plan. We pause to remember that you are our God, and we are the people of your pasture. Help our country turn toward you. Bring revival to this nation. Give our leaders clear vision and sober minds. Bring peace and justice to our schools, and unite us all as brothers and sisters. God, we ask that your kingdom would come, and come quickly. May peace and prosperity come to your children living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. As you think about the freedom we have in this nation, and we've been talking all morning about the freedom that we have in Christ, uh, as we come to our prayer time, let's thank God for those freedoms. Uh, thank God for the men and women that fought to give us those freedoms. But thank God mostly for sending his son to give us their spiritual freedom. Amen? Amen. Let's go to prayer. Dearly Father, we just thank you for loving us so much that you would send your son to die for us. Father, we cannot even begin to comprehend that kind of love. Father, I just ask that right now, in this time of prayer, Father, I ask that you will touch us. Will you renew us? Will you give us your peace and your comfort? In Jesus' blessed name, amen. <laughs>
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. In his blood, perfect submission, all is at rest. I and the Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking up. Lost in his love. Oh, oh, this is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior. my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, 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 oh. Father, may we not make this all about us, but may we make this about sharing your love and your kingdom with those around us. Father, will you give us the boldness to go into our communities and to share your love? Will you give us the boldness to share our story with those people that we meet? Father, salvation is not just about us. It's about the world. 
Father, there are lost and dying people in the world that need to hear about you. Will you give us the boldness to share with those that we meet? Father, as we come to this time in our service when we want to give of our tithes and our offerings back to you. Father, we just ask that you will take the, the money that's given. Will you use it to further your kingdom? Father, we are in a world that is lost and dying, that desperately needs to hear of you. Father, we are told that we are to go and make disciples of all the nations. And Father, we're told that it starts right here in our own hometown, in our backyard. Father, I pray that for families that have a child or a parent that doesn't know you, Father, will you give us the strength to continue to bring them before you and to lift them up and to pray that someone come to their life that will point them to you. Father, will you show us the neighbors that we need to be talking to and sharing our love with them? Father, there are so many people that we meet on a daily basis that we just look past. Father, help us to see the people around us with your eyes. We pray this in Jesus' blessed and As I rise, strength of God, go before, lift me up. As I wake, eyes of God, look upon me, my side. I hear the voice of God, lead me on, be my guide, be my guide, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me, above and below me, before behind me in every eye that sees me Christ be all around me God, oh, fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every sees me, Christ be all around me, oh, oh, Christ be all around me, oh, oh, Christ be all around
your life, your death, your blood was shed for every moment, every moment, your life, your death, your blood was shed for every moment, every moment, your life, your death, your blood was shed for every Every moment, your life, your death, your blood was shed for every moment, every moment. Above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, rise me all around me. Above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. Oh, oh, Christ be all around me. Oh, oh, Christ be all around. Amen. Amen. We get the privilege of hearing one more time from Pastor John Miller. So as he untangles himself from the harp and makes his way down here. Thank you, John. I'm always a little concerned when I come down from there. One, that I'm going to make that step. And two, that my hair is not too messed up. (laughs) That wasn't supposed to be funny, but I guess from your perspective, it makes a difference. Last week, this is actually part two. Uh, It's been a long time since I got to preach a series, which means you didn't finish. <clears throat> and you were smart enough to stop. Actually, there are two different sermons. Last week I talked about there, the, the priests. There was no difference. They were teaching there was no difference between the holy and the, and the unholy, the common things. And, and, and how God was upset with his people because they were intended to make a difference. They were intended to be set apart, a nation set apart for God's purposes. And this week, I I want to uh, change the first word. Instead of no, I want to use make. Make a difference. Remember that song? Well, maybe I'm, no, you uh, what a difference a day makes. Now I know I can't sing, but if I could, I would. Well, you wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut if I could sing. Aren't you glad I can't sing? What a difference a day makes. Anybody know the rest of it? 24 little hours. You don't know that song? Look it up in the internet. It's a great one. What a difference a day makes. Can you think of a day when you got up and then the next day you got up, it was a totally different world. The most, I can think of September 11, 2001. Different from the morning you got up on September 10, 2001. Something happened. Things completely changed after that. You could go to maybe, hopefully, the day you got saved. That first morning you woke up as a child of God from the day before when you were waking up still lost in your sins. Supposedly, according to Scripture, we are a new creation. No longer tripping over a stool. No longer in condemnation. A difference 
A new creation, born again, we call it. That's not just a catchphrase. That's a description of something that is different. I, oh, I never shall forget. That's an old, old gospel tune. I, oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell. And we're not talking about when we dialed 911. Although that could have been a difference if you've ever experienced a house fire. The day before and the day after, quite different. Things change because what happens if, if you're in one of those situations? I remember having to counsel uh, one of my parishioners who had lost everything. Had to start all over. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell, how the fire fell. When Jesus rescued me. Talks about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Paul describes it this way. No longer I live, but Christ lives in me. There is a difference that happens. And in 1 Peter, just in case you were wondering if I was going to get around to the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. And it starts with this word, therefore, which means we should have started at the beginning. Therefore, because of what I just said, and Paul talks in, in verse 3, he talks about new birth, a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verse 4, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. In verse 7, may produce genuine faith may result in praise, glory, and honor. Because of all that, he says, because of all that, there's a difference. Because of all that, there's a difference. It's no small thing what God does when he not just forgives us, not just becomes our Savior, but becomes our Lord. Lots of people like to think and live Christianity and preach Christianity and, and, and try to live Christianity, which really is impossible, without the second part of that phrase. Savior and Lord. We kind of like to stay Lord of our lives, in control. We like to say it this way. I think you can be a Christian and such and such and such. I don't think it would be fair. I don't think a loving God would expect me to go through life without blah, blah, blah. Or expect me to do this. Or expect me to share my faith or expect me to and the reality is it's when we make Jesus not only accept his sacrifice for our sins and become forgiven and he becomes our savior but when we allow him to fill us with his Holy Spirit when we allow him to take control of our lives instead of trying to mess around with ourselves like we had before and thinking, well, you know, in this world, I'll make mistakes. And it's not about making mistakes. It's about when, when, what we do when we make those mistakes. And it's also about those things that we give into. Those old things that so easily entangle us, as Paul describes it. Those sins, not mistakes. We're not talking about mistakes. We're talking about sins that so easily entangle us. So in beginning in verse 13, he says, because of all these things that Christ has done, that has happened to you, his death, his resurrection, the living hope, uh, the inheritance that, we can, that will never perish or spoil or fade, that we will have genuine faith. You know genuine is? Have you ever wondered about that diamond ring you bought, guys? How do you know? How do you know? I worried about that a lot. I went to an authorized dealer. I didn't get it from 
my friend Dominic Sorello's cousin Vinny, although he had one. He's, he said, you can't get anything better than what I got. I don't know if he meant, he didn't think I had enough money or whatever, but I asked the salesman, I said, so how do I know who, don't know, any, who doesn't know anything about stones that this diamond that's the size, well, never mind about that. But how do I know that it's genuine? He says, I guess you'll just have to trust me. I can tell you, you just look in this little thing and he gave me this thing I put in my eye and he, and he says, now just look in there and if you see this and this and this, and I don't remember what he said because I was looking and I couldn't see anything. I could never get the thing to work. I might have had it in backwards. I don't know. But genuine. And if it's genuine, it will make a difference. Evidently, if it's glass, it'll break. And after 40, 60, 40 years and a couple of months, it's still there. It hasn't broke yet. Her finger's a little green, but the, <coughs> I think that's just the circulation problem. But something genuine, something that makes a difference. Evidently, you can cut glass with a diamond. She has not tried it. I don't know why. I mean, if it's a real, maybe that's the problem. She's still wondering. <clears throat> but it makes a difference. And, and Peter, as he talks about this, talks about the difference that Christ makes. I really loved how God worked out the, the scripture for de today that uh, John read. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with the 13th verse, it says, therefore, we've already talked about that before, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Now, I don't know if you're a person who wakes up in the morning and you are ready to go. I had a friend whose brother, his name is Dan Keel. When he woke up, he'd, he'd open his eyes. He'd lay there for a few seconds. This is according to his brother Nathan, who shared his room. He'd lay there for a few seconds, and then he'd sit bolt upright and say, Good morning, Lord! Nathan was not that kind of a person in the morning. And when he woke up, it was usually because his brother was sitting up screaming at the top of his lungs and he was throwing things, but he said it was like I couldn't see, it was a fog, I felt, I just feel like I didn't sleep and it took, takes him a long time to get going. And so to prepare himself for action took a little. So I don't know if you can get ready in a minute, if you're a minute man, since it's close to the Independence Day, minute men, they were ready in a minute. I don't know if you can get ready in a minute. I know when I had kids and I said, let's get ready. It took a lot more than a minute. All five of them were every one different. And it seems like the further down the list you got, the longer it took. In fact, when I said, okay, get in the car, one got in the shower. I don't know with my accent or something. But uh, prepare your minds for action. Get ready. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Especially when we decide to follow him. He tells us that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Well, I, I can put up a pretty good resistance with something I can see. Or at least I think I can. But principalities and powers, I don't know how I'm going to do against those. He says, prepare your minds for action. Be, be self-controlled. Well, start at the hard part, right? Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace given you when Jesus Christ was revealed. Get your mind ready for action. How do I do that? He says, 
Put your mind, here's how you get your mind ready for action, the kind of stuff that you're going to be facing in this world in order to make a difference. And the difference that made, that's made in you, you focus on the grace that was given you when Christ was revealed. In other words, when you got saved and realized you were a sinner and you needed his saving grace, that you were hopelessly lost in your own strength, that you needed what Jesus did on the cross, you needed his power, you needed his grace, that's where you put your focus. We used to sing about it. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. His glory and grace. That we, we sing about these things because this is a reality of how to live the Christian life. How to make a difference and how to experience the difference that Christianity makes. We're never going to get through this if I preach on every word. Um, when Christ was revealed, it says, as obedient children. Oh man, he is so hard on us. Obedient children. How many were obedient children growing up? And how many of you were the other child? Yeah, obedient children. He says, as obedient children. So if it wasn't you, like your brother or sister or the neighbor, if you were only child, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. No excuse there. It says, do not live as you used to before you knew Christ. There's a difference. Something's changed. But just as he who called you is holy, oh, it raises the bar. The bar is raised. It's not just be good. You have to be holy. Remember, holiness is something or someone or that is set apart specifically for God's purposes. But just as he who is called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially. Live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. That should not be too difficult. It would be easy to be someone who is like a stranger in our world today. The things that are going on in our world and things that are contrary to scripture and the walk that Christ lived and des displayed for us is so contrary to our culture today. that we look like we don't belong, like we're actually citizens of someplace else, which we are. We're citizens of a celestial city. We're the children of God. Our home is in heaven with Christ. He is our Lord, our Savior, our King. It says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ a lamb without blemish or defect you were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ I'll say it again you were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who willingly gave himself on the cross and bore your sins once for all, never to be repeated. No need. It was complete. It satisfied what the, the law He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. For your sake. If you're a child of God this morning, I want you in your own mind to yourself, maybe out loud so you can hear yourself. Because sometimes I can't hear myself for the thoughts in my head. That Jesus died for me. 
His blood was shed, say your own name, for you. His blood was shed for you. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Where's your faith and hope? The next election? Lord, help us. Our hope and our faith is in God. I just heard, uh, read this week that in China, they are cracking down even more fervently on the church. Our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are suffering for the gospel. Because, but their faith and their hope is in God. He says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, that you have sincere love for your brothers. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God, for all men are like grass. We need to be mowed. All men are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever. So verses 13 through 14 tells us how the Bible our experience in Christ. The infilling of the Holy Spirit makes a difference. The first difference that it makes is in our thoughts. The renewing of your minds, Paul says in, in Romans. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. In Jeremiah 1, 17, it says, get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, Whatever I command you, do not be terrified of them. The Christian is being challenged to use his mind to think like the latest poll. How, how should we think about this? Well, what does everybody think? You know, I went into a paint store one time, and, and it was, I don't remember which one it was. It might have been Sherwin-Williams. And there was a lady there, a young lady, and I said, are you trained in decorating and, and things like that? She said, yes, I went to, went to college. I said, I'm looking for something. And, and I was wondering uh, what you think, I, I, just some ideas and stuff um, about a room. And I told her what I wanted to do. And she says, and I said to her, I don't care what's trendy I want to know something, I want something creative, something fresh that you would just think would be really cool. And if you had a room, just like I described, what would you do? And the first thing she goes, well, this is a popular color. I was like, that's not what I asked you. I don't want to know what's popular. I want something from your creative mind, something that you would like. I don't care what anybody else, I want your opinion. And you see, we are not to be, see what's popular or what's acceptable or pleasing to the world around us that might make us popular or at least palatable to the people around us. We want to know what Christ thinks. Lord, I want you to decorate my life, order my life, direct my life, 
like you want it to be. Because your word says, I'm to be holy as you are holy. And so I need to know because that's not in my vocabulary of experience. Our thoughts become different. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Two, verse 16, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of, guess who? Christ. I'm glad you said that because we could have filled that in. You know, right now they're going, Oh, well, I saw Shion Dion or whatever her name is, Dion Sanders. No, that's <laughs> that singer girl. Or uh, this is what Tom Selleck wears. You know, or depending on your era, you know, want to look like our movie star. Well, this is what they look like. And if they get a piercing, we get a piercing. If they get a tattoo, we get a tattoo. If they get a, they shave their heads on top, look beautiful, then we want to do that. Sometimes some of us are lucky and it comes naturally, but we want to think like them. But no, for the Christian, because We understand that Christ died because we understand that we were lost and without hope and that without Christ, we we are dead in our sins already. Because of this new life that is ours, we want to renew our minds, that we begin to think like Christ because I want to be like Jesus. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. Jesus, I almost said Justin Bieber, but (laughs) you see how crazy we can get. We think these people and and look at our kids and stuff. They have, you know, I don't know. Did you hang pictures of your movie star friends or maybe it was Batman or somebody on your wall and you you got dressed up like Batman and things like, I'm sorry, Becky, I didn't mean to put out any secrets, but... (laughs) No, she had pictures of me. Actually, it was a frog. I, I never got that. But we, we, we have our minds and we start thinking like this. And this is the way that we try to direct ourselves. But it makes a difference because now we don't say what I think. Well, how much of the world can I have and still be a Christian? We begin to, instead of saying, I think you can do this and be a Christian, we begin to think, what can I do to be more like Christ? What can I do to get closer to Christ? That's the quest of my life, not to get as much of this world as I can, but to get as much of Christ as I can in this world, to live as Christ, to live as Christ, and that's the way I begin to think. You see, Christ makes a difference in our thoughts. Christ also makes a difference in our conduct. It changes the way we act. The call to holy conduct, con, conduct, behavior, holy behavior is based on the fact that God is holy. He said, be holy because... I want you to. No, he said, be holy because I am holy. We have to do this because we are no longer children of this world. But in 1 John, it says, how blessed, how wonderful that we would be called children of God because that's what we are. I don't know if you ever had these words, but I heard them as a child and my children heard them. And, I, and they would do something, and I'd say, that's not going to happen. Well, I'd say, well, Greg Krusek does it. Well, that's maybe what I said. You know, he, he does it. And he says, you're a miller. You're my son. And we don't do that. You bear my name. It makes a difference in the conduct that was expected of me. It was because of who I belonged to. I was a miller, and I didn't do what the Crusacs did. I did what the millers did. But now I am Christ, and I don't do what the world does, but I do what Christ does. It makes a difference in my conduct. 
Many times the Bible reminds us that God is holy. In Leviticus chapter 11, 19, 20, 26, and a whole lot more. Holy conduct is not determined by the culture around us. It's not even determined by believers around us. But we are called to be holy because he is holy. We are to have a different outworkings in our life. And it's because we take something different in or we should be taking something different in. Do you realize that sugar affects the conduct of children? Do you realize that? Do you realize caffeine affects the conduct of pastors? When the caffeine runs out, so do we. What we take in affects how we act. Whether we have the energy or even the desire. And it tells us that we are to be partakers of the holiness of Christ. We are to be partakers of who Christ is. We are not called to holiness in order that we just keep ourselves from corruption. We go around, God cleans us up, now we run around and try not to get dirty. We, we try not to get dirty in the things in the world. That's not it. What we are to be so in, filled with the Holy Spirit, so full of God that we become infectious. The one time you want to be infectious. You want to and are called to, to be holy as God is holy, you are to be taking in so much of Christ that when you get around people, they get infected. They might get convicted. Your infection might convict them. They feel like you think you're better than everybody else. You're like, oh no, oh no. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm not better I have Jesus living in me. And if there is anything good in me, it's Jesus. If there is any praiseworthy, it's Jesus. I am inf- I'm sorry, but I got so much Jesus, it kind of just spills out. And I'm sorry if it got on you, but you'll never regret it. Jesus will make us infectious. It will make a difference in our conduct. And we'll, we'll not not do things just because, you know, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with the girls who do. (laughs) Becky had some habits to quit before I would date her. (laughs) I ain't going to kiss a mouth that's all brown and... No, she didn't do any of that. Boy, am I in trouble today. (laughs) That's all right. I'll run out of gas. I'll be unconscious. She can do what she wants. We are to be partakers of Christ. And since we have these promises, dear friends, let us pure ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Let's ask that question. Will this get me closer to Jesus? Not can I get away with it, But will it get me closer to Jesus? Will it make me more like him? Will it lead me into a lifestyle that is pleasing and acceptable to Christ? Not one that he's going, well, this is the way some Christians think God's going, well, I'll let that go. I mean, after all, you did go to Sunday school this week, so you can get away with doing that. Or you did read your Bible this week, so you can can watch a little of that stuff that isn't so good because you read a little, you watch two hours of a, a nasty movie because you read 10 minutes of your Bible. That should be good. No, we we say, you know what? This is not edifying to me. Yeah, there's a few things that are kind of funny and we just kind of ignore the rest of it. But you know what? 
It's not going to draw us closer to God. In fact, it's, it's just going to be some more of that stuff that we're going to have to try to block out instead of something that we can say, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is bright, whatever is trustworthy, think on these things. Put this stuff into your mind. I wonder if we had a meter of the things that we're putting in. And on this side was things of the world, its values, its ideas, and through entertainment and stuff, and the things that we did through devotion and stuff, how that would stack up in just in time. And, and if we could really see the spiritual effect on our person and our conduct, and why sometimes those things are so hard for us. We struggle with these things. And I think it's sometimes because we feed it. There's an old story about an Indian chief who uh, got saved at a revival. And the circuit preacher, when he came around again, he said to the chief, he says, uh, so chief, how's it going? He says, well, sometimes good, sometimes bad. He says, what does it mean? He says, it's like two dogs, one white, one black, one evil. One good. And sometimes the black dog wins and sometimes the white dog wins. And he says, well, what do you think, chief, makes the difference? He says, depends on which one I feed. It makes a difference in our conduct. Philippians 1.27 says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Worthy of the gospel of Christ, which is his sacrifice on the cross. Whatever you do, do something that's worthy of the cross. Always thinking about the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you. That what you are doing is in light of the cross. The decisions that you deliberately make and choices that you make, your conduct is in light of the cross. Would you be embarrassed realizing that Jesus is hanging on the cross and you're? It makes a difference. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and, do, and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Finally, Christ makes a difference. Well, I don't know if it's finally or not. It looks like I got eight more pages here. But Christ makes a difference in our attitudes. Have you had, you know, I raised children that gave me a lot of material. I owe my daughter for last week, Tori, because I told a story about, mentioned her. I owe her five bucks. Used to have to pay five bucks if I use them in illustration. Becky, she doesn't get anything. She gets everything. But it makes a difference in our attitudes. And have you ever said to a child, do something? And it's like, all right, I'll do it. But I don't have to like it. And they do it and, you know, they're putting their clothes away and they're crumpling them up in balls and Throw it in the door and you know, throw, slam the door because you told them to close the door, please. Were you born in a barn? That's what my dad used to say. I said, I don't know. I was there, but I don't remember. You, you, could, you tell me. I don't, where were you? How come you weren't there? Why did you take mom to a barn? You know, I was like, I don't know, dad, but close that door. And I knew he wanted me to slam it, right? You know, turn off the light. The attitude is important. And so it not only does it affect our conduct, it affects our attitude, which really says even more. The prevailing attitude for a Christian should be reverent awe. I like the way sometimes it, uh, the television, pro, pro, what's the word I want? Huh? Portrays. Portrays, that's it. That's why she's here. We'd, we'd be stuck here for 20 minutes if she, 
portrays people who come into the presence of their idol, you know? And it says, oh, oh, I have all your movies or I, I read all your books or, or whatever it is, you know? And they say, would you mind getting me a drink of water? Oh, yes, I'll get water. Uh, there's a stream, too much. no, um, oh, yes, I'll, I'll do it. And they're so anxious to please. And they're like, anything you could do, anything I could do for you, I would be so happy. Kind of like that first date when she actually responds and doesn't run for the door after you get her home. You know, and, and, uh, and, and you're, you're like, Really? You like me? Oh, that's cool. And you're so in awe, you forget to call them for like two weeks, you know, or something. But you're, there's this reverent awe, which is far greater than that. It's understanding that this is a person of significance. Christ did something incredible for you. There is a reverence, which, which means it's, it's part worship and, and part honoring and, and, and realizing that there's something very special. And realizing that that very special relationship, that very special person is, and you know, sometimes, and this is for real, Every time over the past 40 years, and I realize that she actually said yes on purpose. As much as I tried to trick her into marrying me and liking me, for some reason, God touched her and renewed her mind. And I seemed worthy. And I just never thought that, you know, I had dreamed about that. So I'm still dreaming. And I, there's this kind of like with Christ, when I accepted Christ and he said, I want you to be mine. I want to give my spirit to you. Then when he called me to ministry, and I was like, me? He said, yeah. Read the Old Testament. I used a donkey once. Don't worry about it. I was like, me? And there's this sense when we realize that God deliberately, we weren't a package deal. He knows us by name. He knows every little detail about us. He knows every mistake, every sin, everything. And while we were yet sinners, Christ loved for us. He died on the cross for us. He sent his Holy Spirit to convict our hearts and speak to us and tell us about our need. And then when we asked him for forgiveness, he personally said, you are forgiven. Go and sin no more. You are my brother. You are a child of God. Wait, and I will give you my Holy Spirit and he will fill you with power so that you can be my witness. And there's this reverent awe from understanding all of this. And I think sometimes we forget it. We just put it on the shelf as another thing accomplished. But it's not, it's not an achievement. It's a life. We are new creations in, intended to live for Christ forever. We will have to give an account to the Father. In Romans 14, 12, it says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. I don't like it when the Bible speaks plain. You will have to give an account. There will be a time when we stand before him. And every one of us want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that comes from a genuine awe of who he is and what he's done. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. 
because of the price that was paid. We are reverent awe because of the price was paid. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with, pres- by, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb without blemish or defect. You were bought with a price. And we reflect on that and we understand 1 John 1, 17, 1, 7, it says, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. You see, Christ makes a difference also in our relationships. It affects our relationships. First Thessalonians 3.12 says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. Sometimes brothers and sisters in Christ are the hardest ones to love. Amen? Don't say that too loud because your brother and sister in Christ is sitting right next to you. Don't look around. Don't look at anybody. Don't want them to get to the ideas. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. Christ will make the difference. But you have to let him. You have to let him yield your life to him. Yield your thoughts. Yield your conduct, your attitudes, and your relationships. Christ will make a difference in you. Then and only then can you make a difference in the world. And our world needs Desperately, some difference makers. We need desperately a revival in this nation. Billy Graham's gone. He can't hold a big revival or crusade. But the greatest revivals didn't happen or start because of a big crusade. The Great Awakening started with Jonathan Edwards in a little church. The story goes that he was about to be run out of town, tarred and feathered by his congregation. He preached a sermon that the Lord had gave him. And as, I'm, as I understand, he read his sermons in a monotone, just but he preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the Holy Spirit began to move. The other part of that story is Paul um, uh, on the radio. And that's the rest of the story. Harvey, Paul Harvey would say the rest of the story is during that sermon, a group of ladies who feared for their pastor, whose heart was breaking for their church, went into the room because they had the pulpits up above. You remember the pictures of those old churches where there would be up elevated and then the preacher would be like up there looking down on people when he preached? They were in the little room underneath praying for their church, for their pastor. And a revival began that swept across this nation. Called, even has a name now, called the Great Awakening. Christ will make a difference 
in you. And then and only then can you make a difference that will count. That will count. But you can't give what you don't have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We thank you for that grace which saves us from all sin. And Lord, that you have promised us your Holy Spirit to indwell in us, to fill us, to empower us to be your witnesses. Lord, you have called us to be holy as you are holy. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, like Paul, we will say, it is no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Lord, we are called to be your witnesses, to be Christ to a lost and hurting world. Lord, we are aware of the things that are going in our community, in our country, in this world. And Lord, we pray that you will in so and fill us that we will make a difference for the kingdom of God. For we do and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, shake somebody's hand. Look them in the eye if they're awake. And tell them how much you love them. <laughs>